Thank you all for being here tonight in our very intimate setting. Um, we are so excited to be collaborating with Gulf Coast. And I wanted to extend my heartfelt thanks to Adrian Perry and Hank Rousseau, um, as well as all of our guest readers tonight who I know have been working so hard to prepare something to share this evening, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to visit um, the exhibition that we're really thinking about tonight, the interview, Red Red Future by the artist MPA, just beyond these doors. Um, through this exhibition, MPA explores the future and past life on Mars, thinking about questions of colonization and space travel. Um, so please spend some time with that now or after the, um, the program, and it'll be up th in, through June. <laughs> Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing everything that the presenters have to tell us tonight. I did want to make just one announcement. Next Friday on April 29th from 6.30 to 9.30 will be the opening reception of Mark Flood Greatest Hits, which you can get a little preview of upstairs. And the following day, Saturday, April 30th at 2 p.m., we'll host a walkthrough with Mark Flood and our director, Bill Arnin. Um, we encourage you to check out our website to follow and follow us on social media so you can see everything that's coming up. I'm going to pass the torch to Adrian to um, introduce Gulf Coast, and then I'll introduce the readers. We'll have a little bit of time if anybody has any questions, and we'll save those till, for the end. Um, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. and. I'm glad to see all of you. Some of you I know very well. You'll get your hugs later. Um, but I just want to say another thank you to Cam and to Felice for inviting us to be part of this. Gulf Coast is uh, 30 years old this year, so we're in our Saturn return. Yeah! Yeah, so it means we're doing things and we're changing. Um, but to give you a little bit of information about Gulf Coast, in case you don't know, we were founded in the early 1980s by Donald Bartlemey and Philip Lopate. And then by 1986, we'd become Gulf Coast. In 1983, we were called Domestic Crude. Um, but we're a journal based out of the University of Houston. We're nationally distributed. So a lot of times people will come up to me later and say like, oh, so you're just publishing students from the University of Houston. I'm like, well, I wish that Robin Cost Lewis and Sharon Olds and um, these folks were hanging out with us every day, but they're not. Um, I have a couple copies of the journal, so if you want to check it out later and see what we're all about, we're also online. And one of the reasons it's so great to be here at CAM is because a lot of people People don't know, but Gulf Coast also features art and art writing. People often think, oh, this is just about literature, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and it's not. So you can see beautiful folios in every issue, usually between three and four artists. This issue has um, musings on John Michel Basquiat's time in Soho and an interesting interview about that. Um, Miguel Anahel Rios, who was uh, featured at the Sicardi Gallery, so great Houston roots and at the same time casting a wide net. So thank you so much to the readers for. Um, being game, and again, to Cam for hosting us, and thanks so much for being here. All right, so first up is Erica Jo Brown. She is from New York. She is the author of the poetry collection, I'm Your Huckleberry. She graduated from Cornell University in the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Currently, she is a PhD student in literature and creative writing at the University of Houston, where she is poetry editor and reading series co-curator for Gulf Coast. So welcome, Erica. Thank you. I'm going to read three little, actually, they're not that little. <laughs> it's like three regular poems, <laughs> creatively entitled Mars 1 and Mars 2. Uh, Consider the red veins of the wild rose leaves, the glinting gilt hint of a piece of pyrite. I've heard tell, I've told it myself, that the adios of Sonora are make a moonscape. That assumes a scene particularly earthy then, perhaps something to do with lawns. Seeds manufactured, then bought in a store, sodded and sown by those euphemistically referred to as landscapers by some, as day laborers by others, which some call nothing, not thinking of names or children or the chicken dinners of others. Or perhaps the earthy scene is the sweaty equatorial jungles, lush, unnamed, and dwindling by the day. 
But this is not a critique of late stage capitalism as eminently critiquable and unstoppable as it is. This is about not making your mark, but making your Mars. In the labyrinthine orbitals of the model eyeball, in the fibers of rug upon which your therapy dog sleeps, in the untouched, the unconsidered, you can find it. Mars, too. When one speculates about Mars, the mind reels against scale and space. You make syllables, big bang, black hole, ask questions, how, why, what the fuck. Comparisons, like in the military, it's hurry up and wait, or orbit and bloom. How do these planets align? The same eight partners for some version of eternity. Well, on the human scale, we check chakras, consider a year, a lifetime. The pas de do between my neighbor and me, the sweet smell of laundry wafts through the rafter, so I go downstairs and clean my clothes. I turn my music down so his baby can sleep. Our routines mirrored, minor disturbances. Waiter, there's a fish with legs in my primordial soup. You can't help but wish the mass of bacteria the best. We believe in you more than you'll or we'll ever know. Love the earthlings. Mm -hmm. And this is called Super Dork Time. No, it's not called that. <laughs> it's, it's called the next enterprise, so, you know, it's close. What if our bones and blood vessels are just microcosms of the cosmos, like, whoa, have a cosmo? We are sitting on a porch, summery and starry, nodded with enthusiasm. It's a cosited coterie. It's five o'clock somewhere. Somewhere, too, are kumquats and kindling, liver spots and lobster pots. One begins to feel overwrought. What if our constellations, our kin, and our orbits are fixed? How relieving to be part of the celestial artery, clots and all. Thy body is thy groundling, groundling. Go commune with the cosmic mind. To be not dead, but cozy in the before and after the shuffle ball change of the mortal coil. To be both astral gatekeeper and asshole key, key master. But what moves your voyage, cosmonaut? Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Next, we have Cassandra Rose Clark. She grew up in South Texas and currently lives in a suburb of Houston, where she writes and teaches composition at a pair of local colleges. She holds an MA in creative writing from the University of Texas at Austin. And in 2010, she attended the Clarion West Writers Workshop in Seattle. Her work has been nominated for the Philip K. Dick Award and YALSA's Best Fiction for Young Adults. Her latest novel is Our Lady of the Ice, out now from Saga Press. Welcome. All right, so I wrote a little science fiction flash piece, um, and it is called Those Who Are Left. They meet once a week for lunch, the three of them who are left. We see them at the cafe in the center of the city, away from the power plants and waterworks and massive steaming air compressors they built when they first arrived here, creating oxygen so they could breathe and warm temperatures so they wouldn't freeze. They only had to worry about themselves in those days. And the re when the rest of us came along, not just scientists or engineers, but idealists, whole families, children and grandparents, teachers and doctors, all of us united by the potential we saw in the cold red desert, they became grand dames, leaders in a hierarchy that even the most iconoclastic of us found soothing. Anything would after the turmoil and anarchy on the home we left behind. The cafe where they gather is in the part of the city that looks the most like Earth, old Earth, Earth in its glory days. The tawny stone buildings are painted yearly in blazing white, and tropical flowers, hibiscus, jacaranda, rangipani, birds of paradise, bloom in effulgence, adding oxygen to the filtered air. Those who are left always sit at the same table beside the swimming pool a glittering fragment of Earth's sky that has been captured and tamed and set into the ground. 
It is an enormous luxury, this pool, something they thought they had left behind when they gave up their lives to start new ones here. Who could imagine so much wasted water, water you don't drink or pour into the soil? We think they should disdain the pool the way the more austere of us do, but they don't. Instead, they celebrate the frivolity of that part of the city, the yearning for our past. They drink cocktails the same color as the sunset. They wear bright dresses and a hammered metal jewelry that has become fashionable here as survival becomes easier. They step barefoot into the pool, the water lapping around their ankles, and we can hear their laughter echoing down the street as we make our way to work. There is one rule here in this city and others in the desert. Everyone contributes. We have been taught this rule since we were children. But we all agree, silently perhaps, that for the ones who are left, for the ones who first left, their contributions have already been made. We allow them to become our aristocracy, their days long and empty as they wait out the last of their lives. For them to have made it this far, even that is a luxury. When they first landed all those years ago, death waited for them on the edge of every horizon, an alien death green-skinned and covered in red dust. And so we're happy for them that their deaths will be preceded by cocktails and swimming pools and not terror and isolation. We let them live in the past for one day a week. We have already built our future. When they left Earth all those years ago, they were told they would never return. And yet they do. Once a week, under the vast spread of yellow Martian sky, they do. That's the end. Thank you, Cassandra. Next up is Ayana Jolivet McLeod. She's an artist and writer based in Houston. While minimal, her work is driven by explorations in physicality, materiality, and sensation. She has participated in exhibitions throughout the Caribbean, Latin America, and in the US. Her creative practice takes on many forms, including painting, sound art, and writing. She is organizing and participating in an upcoming exhibition in summer 2016 at Art League Houston, featuring women visual artists who also make sound art. McLeod is the founder of La Botanica, which is scheduled to relaunch this year. Welcome, Ayana. Thanks for inviting me and happy to be here in conversation with the um, really special and sparse and futuristic installation. So good job, Dean. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I'm gonna read a, a work in progress, um, but I first wanted to um, uh, mention uh, a quote by someone who we lost today, and I thought it would be really appropriate to acknowledge him since we're talking about futuristic, sci-fi, out there things. So, quote I'll read is this. Time is a mind construct, it's not real. Prince. So I'll, I'll read my work in progress. 1979, Earth, somewhere. I found a body floating in a gulf of water outside. It wasn't a lake something less contained like an ocean. Face down, her head and limp arms hobbled with the tide of the waves. The only give left in her shell of a body was an occasional clinch and a shake or an uneven tick in her toes and feet. With her soles facing the sun, residues of the lake collected around her once glorified parts. Seaweed clumped her hips Seaweed clumped near her hips. Mounds of earth from the bottom of the ocean floor gathered into pathetic mountains in between her legs. It was impossible to know how long her body had been bobbing there. Enough for the sun to have set and rose at least five times, maybe. The brown on her skin still seemed to ring with Mahalia-like exultations. But it was also ready to let go, to let her go, to let her be in a place where there are, are no names. It was easy to not notice her. She was one of those things forgotten. Even while once vertical, when breaths escaped from between the gaps in her teeth, she remained an unknown. 
I decided to flip her over so that the rolls of her stomach and tops of her kneecaps and the tip of her nose, which extended from left to right for some time, and the length of her nipples and the sporadic gray that covered her entry and the magenta left on only one of her nails, which looked like a sideways Australia, could face the clouds and could all be kissed by the sun. With the top of her head facing a body of water that had swallowed so many before her, my palms tapped her soles and sent her off. With this forward motion, her body faded away. 27, 2072, Mars, somewhere. I decided to come back. For what reason, I do not know. I took off my spectacles, combed my hair, wiped my cheeks, lifted my shoulders, and walked through the door. With an emptiness in the pits of my arms, I stared at my distorted reflection in the crusty, metallic shimmer that coated the second door. There I was, sandwiched between two doors in a boxy, stale, and yellow hallway. I heard my breaths and their echoes in the emptiness as I stood there. To my left was a window with a view of a very vast red hillside, and right behind me was a pass with fretted edges. My knees swayed as I stood in the hallway that hugged my frame and squeezed my constitution, shaking all the things I hold near to me. The doorknob lay in my hand. I caressed it with an intention of turning it clockwise, but after a few minutes, I just held it. On the other side of the door lied moans and cries that await me. A whiff of amnesia swept over my body. I forgot what it was to remember, to touch. With the encounter of two fingers, the door opened with an effortless push. Word escaped, words escaped from their bodies. Sweat dripped from their pores profusely. Their skin was black blue. They spoke the sermon on the circular motion of the heavenly bodies, which is part of the series Craters of Gale and Earth Wounds. The congregation collectively breathes in, breathes out, and the sermon begins. Within this providence, we lie, passing through boundaries that are you and me, they. There are four tributaries that flow within our past onto our ancestors' bodies, their navels, their nostrils, their land, their marshes, their swamps, their prairies, their oceans. Stand and look not in the past. Let us hold close what is anew, where the boundaries collide and exist no more. The boundaries of our objecthood vanish. We are they and they are we. Beyond our outline, we are the land. Let us be creators of new intervals with space between our bodies, commas with profound depth, larger than a bay, more petite than a sea, a gulf, which we fill with the making, shape the rifts, let the curves not be hollow, divulge, go down and around, have the foresight, the prudence, the economy to know not what the distinctions are. Show us the arm of our ancestors, oceans, their seas, extend the waters into to their soils, Punctuate the land to a length that is exact and not always observed. Allow for the disintegration of form, that kind, that one which makers forge. Let us embrace our now, our future, our brilliant, our brilliant hillsides, bold craters and sand dunes, the vast beds of rocks, the bright red dirt and rock. Give us life through the momentary liquid water flow. Remember to penetrate these borders. Recall the fragility and absurdity of markers. I am not representing you, love, or religion. The ideas of represent, representing representation are over. We are home. She went, she walked home in the dust with no shoes. Her feet touched the warm clay. She looked at herself and she saw a stranger and embraced the not knowing, but could not do anything about the gravi gravitational pull within and yearning of her, her ancestors, for she was home. Thank you, Ayana. Next up is Hank Rousseau. He's originally from Cape Town. He has published poems in the Paris Review, Transom, the Massachusetts Review, the Boston Review, and forthcoming in the Common. Rousseau has also published nonfiction and fiction in journals such as the Three Penny Review, the Chronicle Review, the Virginia Quarterly Review, and Tin House. After his MFA at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, he entered the creative writing PhD program at the University of Houston, where he serves as poetry editor for Gulf Coast. Welcome, Hank. talking about mice.
Yeah, so I just want to echo Ayana. Uh, it's such a privilege to um, be talking and, and communicating with everybody here right next to this MPA exhibition. Um, I don't know if you, uh, Felice men mentioned this to me. If you have a chance to check out the catalog, um, MPA interviews as, as part of the work um, Fred Moten and his co-author of um, The Undercommons. Um, really fantastic interview. And, and Fred was here a, a few weeks ago, and Gulf Coast was like, hey, hey. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, what, what a great exhibition. Um, so, so I'm going to just start. I'm going to, I'm going to read um, um, one poem by Craig Rain called A Martian Sends a Postcard Home from, ironically, 1979. Uh, another echo, and um, one poem um, that I wrote a while back that's um, a, a kind of answer in a sense. And um, the Martian writes the postcard home was kind of the beginning of um, this may be fam unfamiliar or, or familiar. It's, it's, it's a kind of very iconic British poem, beginnings of British postmodernism, soft British surrealism. And um, it's the beginning of the kind of Martian school um, where it's kind of drawing attention to, to the role of metaphor in, in, in poetry, like a kind of rhetorical suspension of knowledge, where it's what if, we, what if we describe the world metaphorically as if we were from elsewhere, and in this case, as if you were from Mars. Um, and what, in a sense, I guess, what Rain is saying, what would that actually say about where we are? Because obviously, that's a fiction. So there's a heritage you know, to this concept um, one of which is the, the great um, San Francisco poet, Jack Spicer, who religiously claimed that um, all of his poems were, he was just a radio Spicer, and you know, all of his poems were, were broadcast from Martians, and he was just like <laughs> The words were coming in um, from, from outside, from out there, from the Martians. Um, but it, did, it does strike me the echo between Mars, Muse, you know, so what, what, you know, what does it do for a poem to imagine that its source is from outside? Um, and one last thing mention, to mention before I read it is, um, so Ed Hirsch, who used to be associated with the University of Houston Creative Writing Program, he wrote this glossary of poetic terms. And so, so in the glossary, right, right after the Martian School, which is what, um, this poem gave rise to is uh, Marxist criticism is the next entry. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Craig Rain's father was a, was a, a retired boxer. Um, uh, he, he describes his father as he, he went to this fancy school that he got a scholarship for. So he's, he's working class, Rain, at least he was. Um, and he, just, he said, I, I couldn't say at school my father was an ex-boxer who did faith healing had an epileptic fits and lived off a pension. Um, so for a while I said he was a football manager. Um, but um, worth noting, and we'll get back to why, is, is uh, Rain claims he grew up in a bookless home, uh, a, book, a, book, a bookless prefab, which I guess is British, a Britishism for a, prefab, a, pref, a, a shitty home, a prefabricated uh, temporary dwelling. Um, so let me read the poem for you. So just remember that bookless image as, as we go into this poem. A Martian sends a postcard home. Caxtons are mechanical birds with many wings, and some are treasured for their markings. They cause the eyes to melt or the body to shriek without pain. I have never seen one fly, but sometimes they perch on the hand. Mist is when the sky is tired of flight and rests its soft machine on ground. Then the world is dim and bookish, like engravings under tissue paper. Rain is when the earth is television. It has the property of making colors darker. Model T is a room with a lock inside. A key is turned to free the world for movement so quick there is a film to watch for anything missed. The time is tied to the wrist or kept in a box ticking with impatience. In homes, a haunted apparatus sleeps that snores when you pick it up. 
If the ghost cries, they carry it to their lips and soothe it to sleep with sounds. And yet, they wake it up deliberately by tickling with a finger. Only the young are allowed to suffer openly. Adults go to a punishment room with water but nothing to eat. They lock the door and suffer the noises alone. No one is exempt and everyone's pain has a different smell. At night, when all the colors die, they hide in pairs and read about themselves in color with their eyelids shut. And so, you know, I, you know, it's probably evident, but uh, I, I like this poem as a kind of young man, a boy, you know, when I first started writing poetry. And um, it took me ages, actually, until the point where I was teaching. I couldn't figure out the first riddle, even though it now seems so obvious. Caxtons, what are caxtons? Or mechanical birds with many wings. You know, it's like, I get, okay, the ghost, the haunted apparatus, it's a baby, wow. Um, you know, so it's this obvious defamiliarization technique, you know, making, making the familiar unfamiliar, um, which you, you know, would see in like James Tate and, and other American poets. Uh, but Caxton's, um, and one of my students was the one who solved this, like, it's books, obviously. You know, it's, it's the, the Caxton is the bird with mechanical wings, and, and you hold it in your hand, and they cause the eyes to melt or the body to shriek without pain. And so there was something about me that really liked the riddle of it, and that it took me a while to solve it. Um, and, then, and then knowing that, you know, we're not supposed to read poems biographically, nevertheless. <laughs> knowing that, um, that Rain, you know, grew up in a household without books, just, just it adds a, another level to um, that imagining of Mars, you know, a, a political element, if you will. And so um, my response that I didn't realize was a response at the time on the next page, uh, Sonnet for My Son, um, which came out a few years ago. Um, you can see it's, it's uh, may, perhaps the subtitle would be a South African sends a postcard home. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's um, even though it's maybe not explicit, it is a poem of immigration. Um, even though, you know, once I read it, it may not seem to be obviously signaling that. Um, and part of the circumstance of the poem's origin was, um, at the time, um, feeling, feeling, yeah, like I was on another planet. And, it, and in, in the moment, you know, I was in Western Massachusetts. Um, it's very kind of playful. And, and, and politically, even, it, it seemed like a very possible and playful space. Um, and, and rather than, you know, an echo of the, of the conditions, material conditions of South Africa. And it was probably necessary to see America through that lens, at least for a little while. Um, you know, other possibilities. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the poem. I'm going to read it to you uh, first, though. Uh, sonnet for my son. I don't have a son. That's like everything else, a fiction. <laughs> Just like time. Uh, Prince, thank you. Um, the way to see the invisible salmon is to cook it at once, on lowered heat, in a cast iron pan, glassy with the fat of earlier salmon that cannot be seen. When the salmon is ready, it is cerise. This is supper and also supposition. No one has caught the invisible salmon but the invisible bear, 900 pounds of desire who hibernates in the double bed. The bear is not an idea. Since when was desire a good idea? The bear is a Kodiak instance stolen from the time stream that slips around the airfoil of the present. An aerodynamic hump in the double bed, scion of a long crested line of airborne bears who fishes and whoops asleep Invisible poor dangling over a colander full of water, rife with coho, sockeye, chinook, chum, swirling and transparent as the night is at nighttime. And so, yeah, just, just two more thoughts about this poem. Um, I was reading a lot of D.W. Winnicott at the time, um, playing in reality. Um, and... Um, 
I think in, in some senses where Mars comes back in is, you know, how we imagine elsewhere says much about, in fact, where we are. And um, there's something kind of um, hopeful about this poem. Um, sure, conditions in America definitely echo conditions in South Africa. Um, but the hope remains that in, you know, the political hope remains even that the water will remain in the colander for a moment, you know, an alternative order. Um, you know, in one way of reading this poem, there's, there's many ways that I realized later, and, and I'm sure you have even more. But one way is, is it's a kind of a, it's an address to a fictional son. It's like a, a Martian recipe, if you will. Like, how to be happy. Um, you know, first you take the invisible salmon and then you add a, a few bits of salt. Um, but another version is, you know, how to be home here. You know, where I've chosen to be is another way of looking at it as an immigrant poem. Um, and finally, um, you can also see it in, in terms of poetics, that, that you know, those invisible salmon are, are poetry or poems. Uh, you know, the, this kind of poetics of instant, instantaneity. Um, you know, how do you make a poem? Well, first you've got to catch an invisible salmon. <laughs> uh, glassy with the fat of earlier salmon. And you could, you know, I was obviously totally in love with Stevens at the time. This is supper and also supposition. I'm like, ha ha, you know, a uh, shout out. But, um, um, I, I'm not really writing poems like this from, so much anymore, postcards back to, to Mars, South Africa, but um, I, I, I like to keep it as, as, a, as, a, as a hopeful note, you know, that, that even in these trying times with the selection that I can't participate in, <laughs> there is a, you know, that there's, it's good to see what will stay in the colander, you know, what, what water will stay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hank. Last up, Seba Sewer is a writer and multidisciplinary artist currently based in Houston, where she has recreated a community filled with artists, activists, and educators, similar to one in Karachi, Pakistan, where she was raised. Through her art, Sewer explores displacement and women's issues moving between South Asia and the US while serving as artist in residence at the University of Houston's Mitchell Center for the Arts from 2012 to 2014. Sarah began her memoir, What is Home? In 2015, she received the Mid-America Art Alliance's Artistic Innovations Award, through which she extended her writings into a multidisciplinary exhibition and performance. In 2000, she founded Voices Breaking Boundaries, a multidisciplinary arts organization that tackles urgent social justice issues through art. Welcome, Seba. Thanks. You did well with my name. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> I usually tell people, stick with the first one. Um, so my piece is a response to the exhibition, but it's a response to just being in the moment and time, I think. And it's called Mars, a conversation. Before the end of our lifetime, humans will have sent a one-way rocket to Mars, says Oscar, a family friend. Why would people want to go to Mars, responds my daughter, Minal. What do you mean, Oscar exclaims. There's so much to learn in the universe, Earth and humans. We are just specks in the galaxy. I am fascinated with the study of the universe. How cool is it that our generation will create direct contact with another planet? Maybe in two or three generations, humans will start to populate Mars. Minal frowns. But why go into space when humans have already done so much damage and destruction on Earth? Only 11 years old, Minal hails from the generation that's learning about the damage caused by humans. For example, during the 90s, natural habitat and wildlife around the globe decreased by 70%. And by 2050, planet Earth will face a severe water crisis if changes are not made today. In fact, in Karachi, Pakistan, my home city, even my family town home is no longer receiving water through pipes. Instead, each week, my family pays for a water tanker. Only once the driver unravels his hose does water shoot into the ground tank, after which a machine cranks fluid to our upstairs tank. Water finally flows through our home faucets 
toilets and showers when the two-hour process is complete, if we don't lose electricity to crank the machine, that is. And if not, the procedure takes even longer. Karachi does not have solar power, even though the city is imposed on a desert. I return to the present. But we have so much more to learn, Oscar's arguing in response to Minal's question about why humans should explore space. But Minal reiterates, humans are destroying planet Earth. Should we be going somewhere else to ruin another planet? Minal has inherited some of my cynicism. Isn't destruction part of the cycle of life? Nothing lasts forever, Oscar says, and everything has a beginning, middle, and an end. Weren't you talking about how the sun will disappear one day? And then what will happen to planet Earth? Bacteria have a life, and so do humans. Exploration is just part of our journey. The conversation between Minal and Oscar is an age-old argument about human existence, science, and exploration. And this week, after a 500-year flood, what does that mean anyway? It took more lives and Houston lives and caused destruction to homes. People are again talking about how the existence of Houston on swamp land conflicts with natural habitat. This week, one of the most read stories in Texas Monthly is John Nova Lomax's 2015 essay, The Problem with 100-Year Floods, in which Lomax says, much of Rice University, the Texas Medical Center, West University Place, and the city of Bel Air are in floodplains described as 100-year. So are the suburbs of Myerland and Brazewood Place, the former of which bore the local brunt of these latest storms, and the latter of which saw a quarter of its housing destroyed by Allison. In his piece, Lomax argues about how just the term 100-year flood needs to be revisited, and how humans play a role in the devastation experienced in Houston over and over again. So when people talk about space exploration, I do wonder what the excitement is all about. Shouldn't we tr be trying to fix what we broke? And then, as a writer, I am aware of how memory feeds the work I create. Even though I know change is part of the cycle, I yearn for the days when there were no cell phones and my siblings and I took turns to use the house phone to call our friends. And even still, home conversations, phone conversations were limited because my father was a doctor. In the summertime, my cousins and I performed theater that we wrote and rehearsed without adult guidance. When our performances were ready, our younger cousins sold tickets to the older generation and served as ushers. We did not have summer camps, organized play dates, or even adult supervision. But there was more room for creativity. Today, my cousins and I are scattered like seashells across the coastlines of the globe, connecting through WhatsApp, email, and FaceTime. And our stories serve as a metaphor for arguing for the future of space exploration. After all, our movement is part of the natural cycle of change. And if humans are going to evolve, it makes sense that we will indeed continue to explore space. And how do we know what we're missing if we don't even know the beauty that exists in the galaxy? This is the argument that my friend Oscar presents. And certainly, when I watch movies about space or talk to my aunt who works with NASA, or when I stare at the sky, the stars, I am reminded of how our existence is not even a fleck in, the gal in one galaxy. I can understand Oscar's excitement, but me, I am always interested in going back in time. I would be cheering if someone were to tell me that a time machine has finally been invented and we can return to places and times of the past. And when we think about the devastation that Christopher Columbus brought to North America once he made his discovery, or how the British occupied South Asia, Australia, large masses of the African continent, I am even more concerned about the unintended harm we could inflict on other planets. As my mind drifts, Oscar and Minal stay on course. 11-year-old Minal. Well, I'm not interested in going to Mars. There's too much I want to see on planet Earth. I need to visit two more continents and many more countries. Family friend Oscar. Well, I want us to continue exploring the galaxy and making new discoveries. We still have so much to learn. Thanks. Mm.